The next several lessons are going to be about counterstrain technique. And this video in particular is going to serve as an overview where we talk about the technique itself and then all future videos within the counterstrain section will talk about individual regions of the body on which more detail will be explained. Let's start by actually talking about the technique itself. So counterstrain, which is actually known as strain counterstrain, if you're going by the literature, is a passive indirect technique. So passive means physician moves the patient. Remember the P's, P for physician. And indirect technique means that you are targeting your treatment towards the patient's ease or the direction that a certain body area prefers. The goal of counterstrain is to resolve the pain of things called tender points. And we'll talk about what tender points are on the next couple slides. But you resolve the pain of these tender points by placing a joint, muscle, tendon, etc., basically any body area, into the most comfortable position, also known as the ease, by shortening the muscle. The end goal of your treatment when you're using counter strain is at least a 70% reduction in pain. And that'll be very, very high yield as well. So what you want to know about counter strain so far is that it's passive and direct, it treats tender points, and it's not effective unless it's resolving at least 70% of a patient's pain. The indications for counter strain, the only one you need to be concerned with is somatic dysfunction. And this is pretty obvious, even if you don't realize it. On Comlex, if they give you a patient with a tender point, by definition, the presence of that tender point means there's somatic dysfunction. The absolute contraindications include trauma, especially recent trauma to the affected area, severe illness, or severe spondylosis. Relative contraindications include the patient being unable to cooperate or the presence of connective tissue disease. So what are these tender points? We need to talk about tender points because again, the goal of counter strain is to improve the pain associated with tender points. Tender points are small, hypersensitive, tender nodules, and these nodules are caused by dysfunctional neuromuscular reflexes, which result in painful musculoskeletal contraction. It's really caused by something called excessive gamma gain, right? We'll talk about that in just a second, but gamma gain is a term that you need to be familiar with. And a very, very high yield thing to understand about tender points is they do not refer pain when they're palpated. So when you're doing your structural exam and you palpate something that feels like a nodule, if it refers pain, it's actually something else called a trigger point. And if it doesn't refer pain when you palpate it, then it's just a tender point. And it's the tender points that we treat with counter strain. So this is a very high yield distinction. Tender points do not refer pain, trigger points do. It's a very, very high yield point for complex as well as in class exams. So what about this term gamma gain? I told you that it's important to understand. A lot of people, they see counter strain show up on complex and they go, ooh, counter strain, tender points. It's just the association in people's brains. But there's actually a lot of physiology behind where these tender points are coming from. And in order to understand that physiology, you have to understand the muscle spindle. The muscle spindle refers to a network of stretch receptors that detect stretching within the muscle belly and in response to that stretching, stimulate contractile signals so that the entire muscle can contract. When we think about muscles, we think about the muscle as being one singular unit. For example, the biceps muscle. And if you imagine somebody curling a dumbbell and contracting their biceps muscle, it, it doesn't necessarily work like all of the fibers just contract at once and the biceps uniformly contracts. There's actually a lot going on beneath the microscope, so to speak, where you've got different stretching generating more contractile power. And that's the goal and the responsibility of the muscle spindle network. So I'm going to walk you through the normal physiology in the muscle spindle and then I'll tell you what goes wrong with that normal physiology that causes tender points. So the first thing that you need to understand is what you're looking at. The muscle spindle is composed of two different parts. The outer section, which is shown in blue, is the extrafusal fibers. And the inner section, shown in green, are the intrafusal fibers. The green are a lot smaller than the outer blue part. And when you think about the biceps muscle, the big meaty muscle that you see in your head is mostly comprised of that extrafusal part. But buried deep in the muscle on individual fibers are intrafusal muscle fibers. And that's what I'm depicting here in green. Now let's walk through the normal physiology. 
Normally, some amount of load is placed on the muscle, and the intrafusal fibers, which are again shown in green, detect stretching. Once those intrafusal fibers are stretched, they stimulate this cascade of events. The next part is that the sensory neuron gets activated, and it goes over to the spinal cord and synapses with the motor neuron. So this is how the intrafusal muscle fiber is communicating with the central nervous system. Once that signal gets processed in the central nervous system, specifically in the spinal cord, it relays back an efferent motor neuron. And that efferent motor neuron synapses or terminates on the extrafusal part of the muscle spindle, which again is shown in blue. Once that motor signal comes back, it tells the muscle to contract and to contract powerfully. And I'm depicting that here by making those blue lines even fuzzier. So you can see that the extrafusal part of the muscle spindle is what's generating that powerful contraction. Now, as this happens, those signals are also inhibiting the ability of the intrafusal fibers, again shown in green, to detect more stretch. And you might imagine that if that was not happening and there was no inhibition of the intrafusal fibers, more stretch would get detected more signals would be sent to the spinal cord and there'd be more extrafusal contraction. And this reflex would happen over and over and over again. And over time, you would get this spastic hypertonic muscle that's really painful. So this is what happens in the muscle spindle. And in order to really understand what happens that causes tender points, we need to take a closer look at the motor neurons. There are two types of motor neurons, each with distinct functions in this event. There are alpha motor neurons and gamma motor neurons. The alpha motor neurons control that highly contractible fiber element in the extrafusal or outer blue part of the muscle spindle. And those alpha motor neurons are responsible for the power of the muscle. Again, they're controlling that outer blue part that really does the major, bulky, powerful contraction of the muscle. The gamma motor neurons are instead responsible for the mild contractile fiber element in the intrafusal or that inner green part. And again, these control keeping those intrafusal fibers tout and responsive to stretch. Now, if we go back to our physiology here of what's supposed to happen normally, and we only focus on that motor efferent neuron coming back from the spinal cord, what you could think about in your head here are that there's two different motor neurons technically. There's the alpha motor neuron, which again goes to that extrafusal muscle, which is shown in blue. And then there's the gamma motor neuron, which goes to that intrafusal muscle fiber, which is shown in green. And the problem that causes tender point formation is when you have an imbalance of the gamma and the alpha motor neuron signals. And what we refer to this as is gamma alpha coactivation. And if you get more alpha activity or more gamma activity swinging one way or the other, you could probably imagine that the muscle contraction will become quite dysfunctional. Normally, in the case of tender points, the problem is that there's way too much gamma motor neuron signaling. So by there being excessive gamma signaling, which is known as gamma gain, you are constantly having those gamma motor neurons stimulate the intrafusal muscle fiber so that it continues to detect stretch, it continues to stay tout, and you get this development of this extra tout muscle band within the belly of the muscle itself. And over time, as that continues to signal the intrafusal muscle fiber, you get the development of tender points. Now that we understand the muscle spindle and how gamma gain can contribute to the formation of tender points, let's talk about the technique itself of counter strain. Counter strain is actually a pretty straightforward technique. Let's go through the steps. Step one of counter strain is you obviously need to identify a tender point. Step two, is that you assess the pain of that tender point by palpating it and then asking the patient to rate the pain that they feel when you palpate the tender point on a scale from one to 10. Step three is while you palpate that tender point, you place the affected area into its ease. And the future videos in this section about counter strain in different regions will go over the different positions that you use to treat all of these different tender points. What's important to note, however, is that as you're placing the patient into their ease, you approximate their ease first, and then you fine tune that ease by using small motion arcs to get them into the exact most optimal position of comfort. Step four 
is once you have the patient in their ease, you hold them in that position for 90 seconds while continuing to monitor the tender point. Step five, after that 90 seconds ends, is you return the patient to a neutral position. And step six is you reassess the tender point. This is how you do counter strain. Six very simple, very straightforward steps that will be the same exact sequence regardless of which tender point we are talking about. So this video is supposed to serve as an overview about the counter strain technique and the principles behind counter strain because the next several videos within this counter strain section are going to talk about where all of these tender points are located by region and what position you have to put the patient in to treat all of those tender points.